and I like to keep this basic. Uh, I don't have any numbers in here. Uh, it's the things that really you need to know or you need to pass on to your students once uh, you become a certified instructor or if you already are uh, to keep it uncomplicated so that they can easily understand what's involved. Um, for the CFI spin endorsement, I just uh, did some research and I work with the uh, FISDO to find out who can receive the spin training uh, for the CFI. You must hold the commercial and instrument certifications and that comes under 61.183 for eligibility. Um, the important thing to remember is that you really want to pay attention if you're using this uh, presentation to prepare, to help you prepare, because if you do not pass the oral questioning on spins, then you must bring an aircraft uh, and demonstrate spins. You actually have to go up and do spins, and that's in the same regulation under I-2. So you want to really know what you're doing. The big thing is get in the books, the Airplane Flying Handbook, and that's the main source of information. Of course, you, if you want to really wow the examiner, you can go into um, aerodynamics for naval aviators and some of the other, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the other uh, things that are out there, the other manuals and other things that will help you uh, present to your students. And that's really the bottom line, is to be able to present to your students enough knowledge so that they can get out of a spin. I'm an advocate for teaching students spins before they solo. Some people are pro, some people are con. I'm for it because I don't want them to uh, get in trouble. Now, I have built a course for the Redbird, uh, which uses the 172 um, information for teaching spins, which we're going to soon start uh, here at East Coast Aero Club. Uh, so the the one thing that you want to make sure that you understand and be able to explain is the difference between spins and spirals. And we remember uh, John F. Kennedy Jr., how tragic an accident that was on his way to, uh, I think it was Long Island to Hyannis. And, uh, and it took his life and the life of two other people as well. So in the spin, as far as the G-load on your body, it's lower. Basically, Mother Earth is pulling the aircraft down, so you're effectively, you're somewhere less than one G, effectively. Uh, whereas in a spiral, you have a high force on your body or a higher G because the nose is down, you have a high airspeed as opposed to a stalled airspeed in a spin. And if the examiner asks you, what is the airspeed in a spin, the answer is stalled. Um, too many times I hear it's fast. And of course, the question I ask is, what do you mean by fast? The answer, which will suffice, is the airspeed is stalled, um, whereas in a spiral, it's high. The bank, in, uh, in, as far as the spin goes, will vary. The airplane may rock and roll, go back and forth, may spin with the wing up into the spin or the wing down into the spin. And I've seen it both ways. Whereas in a spiral, you have a steep bank in one direction. So when you're teaching, or being examined on it, it's a good thing to uh, make sure that uh, whoever you're talking to understands or you can explain the difference between a spin and a spiral. Why do pilots spin? Uh, distractions normally, um, that's one of the high, or, or the, uh, one of the main reasons why, uh, why pilots go into a spin, they're looking at something, not paying attention. Uh, improper stall recovery. Uh, I'm sorry, improper stall entry, especially the uh, power on stalls where the ball is not centered. Improper use of the autopilot. And we know some autopilots can set a rate of climb that won't maintain a safe airspeed. The autopilot tries to maintain a vertical speed uh, resulting in a stall. If you don't pay attention to it, trust but ver verify that autopilot. We, uh, we've seen this picture before and we can see in the spin, uh, the left, wing in a right spin is less stalled, and the right wing in a right spin, the, uh, the right wing is realizing more drag. Uh, we could go into all kinds of different explanations of the angle of attack, but you can see the less stalled left wing in this case has less of an angle of attack, and the, uh, uh, the one with more stall has, uh, an has a little bit more angle of attack. 
And here's, a, here's something that um, we don't think about, but one day you may fly an older airplane built in the 30s. And I had an experience where I almost lost my life. Um, don't tell the FAA, please. But I was uh, flying, I was, uh, I got checked out in an airplane called an Aronka um, Chief, which is a side-by-side -side Aronka Champ. And I was told, go figure this airplane out and go, uh, because you're gonna teach the owner how to fly this airplane. So I got old Bert from, uh, who'd been flying for 30 years to go up with me and he, uh, we did some landings and some stalls and came down and he says, yeah, you're okay. So I went up by myself and I thought, well, I'll go to a couple thousand feet and do a two turn spin in this aircraft. And uh, I'd been spinning the Cessna 150s and the 150 recovers as soon as you release the back pressure if you don't do too many turns and build up a lot of momentum. So I did two turns, did the spin recovery, and it didn't recover. It just kept spinning. So I put it back in, put in the pro spin controls and then really forced the controls, especially the rudder, full opposite and held it there because that's what I was taught. And eventually it stopped, um, got pretty close to the trees, scared me quite a bit, flew back, found Bert, and I said, Bert, why is this air that the airplane took so long to recover. He took me over to the 150 and he says, what do you see about this wing? And I said, at that time I knew about washout, the twist of the wing that causes the wing root to stall before the wing tip. Because the wing tips want to keep flying even in a stall, they have less of an angle of attack. Um, and he says, go over and look at that Aronka Chief. So I did and I realized there was no washout. So washout will cause the airplane to recover sooner than if it did not have washout. Uh, the certain facts in spins, and then an aircraft must realize stall and yaw. It has to stall and it has to have something to yaw the airplane, either left or right. So we know that a spin is an aggravated stall that typically occurs from a full stall uh, with an airplane in a yawed state. Um, so what causes the yaw? Um, it'll yaw because of the input of the rudder, and we're talking about full input. Now some airplanes, it does take a lot of input of the rudder to stall, but they will, uh, to yaw, but it will yaw somewhat. But also the engine and prop effects, including P-factor, torque, spiraling, slipstream, and gyroscopic precession, and wind shear, including wake turbulence, will also cause yaw. So if you stall the airplane and one of those factors imposes yaw, the airplane very well could spin. P factor is the most pro prominent turning force. And I'll show you in a later slide what I teach when I teach spins on the way out to the area. We do our clearing turns, of, of course, and then and we slow the airplane down, raise the nose, put our feet on the floor, add full power, the nose goes left, and that's P factor. So that is the yawing force. And of course, the airplane, because it's turning left in this case, causes the right wing to go faster, causes more lift, and a, results in a bank to the left. And then we roll to the right, and we see the nose swing left, even though the airplane rolls to the right. And that's as a result of adverse yaw, the down aileron. And one thing that you could show to your students and wow an examiner is you go out to the airplane during pre-flight, and show them in most of these light airplanes today that the aileron will go up more than it goes down. And that's to counter or to reduce the effects of uh, P, uh, I'm sorry, adverse yaw. Because the most drag is re, uh, realized from the down aileron. Uh, when is P factor most often found? Takeoff as the nose of the aircraft rotates, slow flight, power on stalls go around. Uh, so when you do the power on stall, that's normally when we see people doing spins and the go around. So I've asked our instructors to teach the trim tab stall. If you take the CFI initial test with me, I ask you to demonstrate and explain at the same time the trim tab stall, which is simply putting the aircraft in a glide as if you're landing, simulating a landing, trimmed up with full flaps, so you can take your hands off the controls and the airplane will hold that attitude, add full power, the nose pitches up, and we stop it at the horizon. So it, on the test, I do not ask the applicant to stall the aircraft, probably because I'm too scared. All right, moving on.
spin recovery procedures, the PARE, and I've added a little bit, uh, power to idle. Why? Because if you add power, that tends to raise the nose. Don't forget the elevator's up. It'll raise the nose. It could possibly go flat, in some cases uh, unrecoverable. Uh, aileron's neutral, and I'll show you uh, why in the next slide. Rudder full and aggressively opposite, then neutral when rotation stops. Going neutral is most often forgotten on practical tests. So they say, we'll put in full right rudder for a left spin and hold it and then release the back pressure and then pull. Okay, so you're gonna hold that rudder in all the time. Well, no, so what do you do with the rudder is the next question I have to ask. And they say, well, I guess I should put it in the middle. And I say, is that a question or an answer? And of course, that's what they should be doing. Release the back pressure or forward if forward pressure if you're inverted. You fly aerobatics, that's something that you should know. Recover from the dive. Um, when you're power off, you, you uh, add full power. I made a spelling error there, sorry. And pull. Um, in aircraft, uh, military aircraft that drops bombs, we had a dive recovery chart. So uh, people like Chris Perita and, uh, and every, anybody who's full military airplane, there was always a dive recovery uh, chart. So in a 60 degree dive, at say 450 knots, uh, you pulled, you would lose so much altitude. But the whole um, chart was based on the fact that you had power in, full or just about full power. And so it's okay to pull. So the question is, how hard can you pull? Pull to the buffet or the horn, because you're not stalled. And that's the what we, what we can consider lift over drag max. This is, the uh, smallest radius that the uh, airplane will realize, resulting in less of an altitude uh, altitude loss. Once the aircraft stops spinning and the rudder is positioned neutral, the aircraft is now in a power off stall. That's all you have to do is recover from the power off stall. Um, why must the ailerons be neutral? Uh, manufacturers say that because they don't want you to make a mistake. Uh, think of it this way. The most drag is realized by the down aileron. So let's just say that we're spinning to the left or right, and the natural, which is the wrong response by the pilot, might be to position the ailerons in the opposite direction, which, much like the reaction of a skidding car, uh, would be our reaction to that. Car skids right, we want to turn the wheel to the left, and obviously that's wrong because we know that we should steer into the skid. Same thing. So if we're in a right spin, we put in left aileron, the right aileron goes down, causes more drag, and takes, and as a result, it takes longer to recover from the spin. So neutral ailerons. However, in the extra 300, um, it does talk about using pro spin ailerons. In other words, the aileron of the spin, so if you're in a right spin, you put the ailerons to the right, left aileron comes down, causing more drag and reducing the amount of time it takes to recover. The airplane um, flying handbook talks about the use of aileron and it talks about the fact that aileron in the direction of the spin may accelerate the rate of rotation, which it could, and steepen the spin attitude and delay the recovery. And that's the extra 300 uh, flight manual that I previously discussed. So make sure that the ailerons are, are neutral. Bill Finnegan, who teaches a spin course down in Maryland, talks about neutralizing all the controls and then the airplane will eventually recover. He does the spin training in a two place S, uh, pits S2C. Um, so it's best to teach your students to keep the ailerons neutral so they don't mistakenly put in the wrong aileron. Um, this is, I'm gonna to try to get this up and hopefully Dominic will be able to see this. But this is a tragic, a very tragic video. Uh, you can. See if you can determine why the pilot turned and what happened and why. Are you seeing, are you all seeing this? Uh, and uh, are you um, are you sharing your full screen again, Mark? Like before? Okay, let me. Uh, what do I do? Go to new share. Yeah, I'll just click share and then uh, click screen again. Maybe maybe it got switched. Okay. There you go. Okay, that's it. All right, the Mooney will come out. I don't know if you can see my pointer. You see a tree to the left. You'll see a Mooney come out there. 
And let's see what happens to this. And then we'll, if you want, we can discuss it. I'll stop it there. Does anybody want to see that again? Okay. So I can't hear everybody, but uh, I don't know if we can discuss it, but I'll, I'll carry you through this if that's okay. Um, so the, the individual takes off and somewhere right before they turn, the engine failed. So we're assuming that it fails somewhere in here, but look at the nose position. It's up. And it stays up, it stays up, it stays up right until here. This is where I, I'm estimating that the aircraft stalled. Okay, now this is all speculation. And as mishap investigator, we're not supposed to speculate. But most likely, yeah, this is one of the things I would certainly look at. And then here, you can just see, if you can see, it looks like to me on the ailerons, you have a little blob there, which is uh, means that one of the ailerons is either up or down. And I'm, my uh, investigation would say, well, the right aileron's probably up, which would be which would be wrong. They're not neutral, and um, and thus he he spins to the left. He probably tried to use some rudder to rudder it around to get back faster. So the question is, what should what should the pilot have done? Well, in the first place, once an engine starts to lose power. You have to put the nose down. So when we talk about engine failure on takeoff, we don't want to spin on takeoff if the engine fails. So you've got to put the, you have to put the nose down to at least an attitude that results in a glide. And then as you gain altitude, you can turn more. Um, it disturbs me to hear people say in their briefing that I won't turn unless I'm 800 feet or 1,000 feet. And my uh, response to that is, okay, so you're gonna go straight ahead into the housing complex and the schoolyard into the rocks and the, uh, the poisonous snakes and the alligators rather than turn 20 degrees to the left to get to the best field. And they go, oh no, wait, of course I turn 20 degrees to the left, but they have to brief it. They have to understand that, okay? Let's see if I can get out of this, get back to my slides. Uh, okay, so how do I get back to my slides, Dominic? Let me see. Hey, and you're trying to get back to your slides, Mark. Okay, I think it's here, and then uh, see screen. There it is. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So that's the uh, the impossible turn video. Now I would I would uh, warn people instructors and pilots not to do this but when i was teaching more often than i am now and teaching pri primary students i would teach them to be able to turn the airplane around and land the opposite direction at about 500 feet above the ground and to show them how to do that not a good thing to practice without somebody helping you and showing you who's done it before and fully understands exactly what's involved okay Uh, so what happened to the movie, what, Moody? Why did he turn? The engine failed because he tried to turn back to the runway, which he thought was the best landing spot. Um, he had to take, he really should have taken whatever, whatever was in front of him, trying to minimize uh, damage and be able to walk away from that aircraft and go to the nearest bar, uh, which is always my plan. Uh, just don't tell the, the FAA I told you that. Uh, what was the aircraft's nose position when the engine failed? It was up which resulted in decaying airspeed. He stalled and then he spin. He stalled. The ailerons, from what I saw, were opposite to the spin direction and maybe the rudder was in the spin direction to try to make a sharper turn or a faster uh, nose tracking towards the run runway. Here are the weak areas I most commonly see when administering practical tests and, and guidance. Not understanding that in a spin as opposed to a spiral, the aircraft airspeed is stalled. I already talked about that. Not teaching students that the rudder must be returned to neutral once the spin ro or the rotation stops. And uh, most everybody forgets to include this. Uh, I think out of uh, all of them, maybe one or two percent of the people I test know this or they tell me this. During recovery, if the rudder is maintained full opposite position of the spin rotation, 
and the aircraft were to be stalled again, it could end or spin in the opposite direction. And this is where the confusion comes in. Investigated T-33 mishap out of Panama City, Florida uh, many years ago, and the pilot was in the top of a loop, pulled too hard, had improper rotor input, and the aircraft stalled and spun from inverted, and uh, spun all the way to the ground because he didn't know where to look. He didn't know what uh, the recovery was. He didn't look at the extended foot, which is the direction of rotation. Uh, and keep in mind that there are certain axioms that I'll cover in a moment. So if you were to come to me and uh, get spin certification, this is what I, what I do. And hopefully you can see this. Uh, first of all, you must come prepared to teach the spin. You gotta have your lesson plan and be ready to talk. And uh, let's see, I'm getting your internet connection is unstable. Okay. Um, so we, and we can still hear you, Mark. Okay. Uh, I have a question, uh, please. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, back on slide 16, can you copy and paste that link into chat? It'll be a lot easier to, yeah, that third bullet point there. Can you copy that and paste it into chat? Uh, I have no idea how to do that. I, I can take care of that after the presentation for you, Bob. Thank you. Absolutely. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay. So the P factor and Edward Shaw demo that I discovered and uh, guys like uh, Chris Parita, they know about the G awareness exercise that gets you prepared to pull G's when you pull out of the uh, out of the um, the recovery. Because uh, at the end, if we're in an aerobatic airplane, we do loops and rolls. Uh, we teach it. I start with a power off stall, and that's how we start in most all the spins or some of the spins. Then we do a one G left and right spin, and once we go through that and you can do it on your own, you're, you're certified. Uh, base to final, oops, okay, base to final, which is a cross control entry. Uh, Kirshner years ago had a very, very good explanation of this. So let's just take uh, somebody, we'll call him Joe Bag of Donuts, okay? So here's Joe and he's in a left turn, base to final, and he overshoots final. So he goes beyond the extended center line of the runway. And so he thinks, Maybe I'll just rudder it around using left rudder in this left turn. Okay, and oh, the right wing is coming up and I'm going past that 30 degrees of bank that my instructor said never to go past. So I'll put in right aileron. So what happens now, you're cross controlling and as a result, the aircraft effectively is losing lift because you're putting, instead of having the, the relative wind hit the wing head on at a 90 degree angle, you're creating an angle losing lift. The airplane comes down faster Joe does not know that all he has to do is add a little bit of power that'll help control his vertical speed. And uh, eventually he spins. Which way is he going to spin? He's going to spin towards the applied rudder. And with the elevator back, he will always spin upright in relationship to the plane of the earth. Uh, so as instructors, we need to remember to teach our students go arounds to competency prior to them going solo. And also slips. They shouldn't have slipped. Uh, then we do a entry from P factor and adverse Shaw, which is what we demonstrated on the way out. So we simply, just like the demonstration, we do our clearing turns. And don't forget, you have to look underneath as well as all the way around, because that's where you're going. Stall the aircraft. Um, I'm sorry, you slow the airplane down, feet on the floor, add full power, the nose goes left, you come in, the, the result is a left bank. And then you simply put in some right aileron and bring the stick back all the way back to the stall. The P factor is the yaw as well as the adverse yaw and your aircraft will spin in this case to the left in American made engines. The Beggs Mueller recovery, very important. And this is something that I would uh, suggest you pay attention to because in these light airplanes, this could save your student from having a stall spin accident. Gene Beggs and Eric Mueller were very famous aerobatic pilots and they did a study um, on uh, spin recoveries. And what they found in these light aircraft and some other aircraft as well, is if you pull the power to idle and let everything go, the airplane will recover by itself. So the, once that's done, you find the horizon, roll the wings level to the horizon, add power and pull up to the horizon. 
and maybe a little bit of a climb in case you think you're too low. So basically just letting everything go, power to idle, and the airplane will normally recover all by itself. It's like, it's magic. But the one thing it will do, since you're not holding on to the elevator, that will hold some up, up elevator and reduce the nose down pitching or the pendulum effect of the nose going down, you'll be popped out of your seat. And you need to explain to your students that's a good thing because that means that the angle of attack is being reduced and we can now uh, expect to see the airspeed increase and recover. Now, of course, one of the important things that must be realized is, realized is the effects of an FCG. If you have an FCG, it's gonna make the airplane harder to recover, requiring more forward elevator. Uh, so that's something to be considered. Uh, so that's why they have the uh, utility category in the, uh, in the aircraft uh, flight manuals. Uh, we're in an aerobatic airplane. I show a, a spin from the top of the loop. So we do a spin, we do a loop, and at the top we pull in the back stick and kick either left or right rudder to show that the airplane will end up upright because of the aft elevator. If we were to push the for stick forward while inverted, it would, stall, it would uh, spin inverted. Then we do loops and rolls, and then we come back and we do an overhead approach and the slip to a landing. Now this, the overhead is a neat thing to do, it's a lot of fun, but the slip to the landing has a purpose of showing the, uh, the student that we can really slip the daylights out of these airplanes so long as the nose is down. Now, this is where you really need to have training if you, if you really want to get into a good slip using all the controls, but the nose must be down. And then realize that when, when you kick out of the, the, uh, that slip, that you're gonna immediately gain airspeed. So you've gotta be able to hold, uh, control that. What I do is I hold it in the slip until I feel the airplane getting to an airspeed that I can land out and then I kick it out of the slip. And that just simply takes practice and um, more practice. Why should a pilot add power after the spin is stopped and the aircraft is unstalled? Uh, and I talked about the dive recovery charts. Adding power in the propeller driven aircraft adds uh, wind over the wings and also over the elevator, making it more effective. And then res the result is less of loss in altitude. And you can pull pretty hard, as I said, all the way to that stall warning horn or to the buffet if the stall warning horn does not work. The buffet's the clue. Don't go beyond the buffet because now you're going to stall and you will lose more altitude. Aerodynamic rules, the aircraft will always spin towards the applied rudder. Kick left rudder, it'll spin left. Right rudder, it will spin to the right, whether you're upside down or right side up. The spin will always be upright with back elevator no matter how you start. Upside down, right side up, vertical, up or down, doesn't matter from a, from a bank. Uh, it'll always end up spinning upright with the elevator back and inverted with the elevator forward. Uh, Chris may, Chris Burita may remember in the F4, there was an odd thing that it would do. Uh, when you talk about contrary to the controls, the aircraft reacting contrary to the controls, you can take the F4, the Phantom, raise the nose and, and put in right rudder, the airplane would slide to the left with about a 50. Uh, the all aircraft spin recoveries are not the same. The T6 and the SNJ, for example, those World War II, 600 horsepower round engine aircraft required a full forward stick uh, until an uncommanded roll was uh, realized that tells the pilot the aircraft is going to recover. Pilots have spun in because they didn't know this. The T-37, T I'm sorry, was the same. Um, so you've got to read the flight manual and understand how that spin recovery is supposed to be performed and also get training. Spins in uh, instrument meteorological conditions. The turn coordinator, and this is a real foot stomper, the turn corner coordinator or the little airplane or, or the needle is the only instrument that shows you the direction of rotation. That's what it was built for, to show you the direction and rate of turn. Not the ball, not the directional gyro, and not the attitude indicator. None of those to show you the direction to turn. So if that turn indicator is tilted to the left, 
you need to put in right rudder. While you're doing that, if you're in a left spin, turn coordinator will be to left, your left foot will be extended. And now you need to slam in the right rudder. Interestingly enough, you think about the airmail pilots uh, back when they were flying in jennies in the old aircraft. Uh, I met a, a, a woman whose dad was an air, airmail pilot. She told me a story that her dad had told her. Back then, the, uh, we'll say Joe Bagadonis was taking off from Boston, flying to uh, Albany, New York in the middle of the night. And uh, Fuzzy Baxter over in Albany would take a light and shine it vertically where it hit the, the ceiling. He would go out so many feet and basically uh, look up where the, um, where the light hit the bottom of the, of the clouds and through the user angle, he could, the clouds are 3000 feet overcast. The visibility is okay. Uh, so Joe would take off, get there and based on dead reckoning, and I, you can see where they got the word dead from, he spins the airplane down through the clouds in hopes that he, he uh, sees the oil lamps that Fuzzy put out for him at 3,000 feet and then recovers and lands. So why do you think that they had so many deaths during the early airmail air days? Go figure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a pre-flight of an aircraft that's been overstressed, uh, or to see if it's been overstressed. You can look uh, for creases that runs longitudinally, in other words, from the front to the back, in the middle of the area of the flap, uh, creases should not be there. Don't fly the air, aircraft. Report it to the dispatcher, write it up, and ground the aircraft, and certainly tell maintenance. Look at the seams in the metal skin, and, and I've got a picture here. If it is overstressed, the holes in the, that the rivets go through will appear. You may see the green zinc chromate anti-corrosive paint in the hole. Don't fly the aircraft. And again, report this. And we're, see, uh, so that's, that's the rivet. And those are the skin where they overlap. And if they pull up, the skin pulls apart, you'll see the zinc chromate. Somebody's abused that aircraft, do not fly it. Um, I've got another one. This one's a little bit out of sequence, but uh, I wanted to relate this to you about a Beechcraft Baron spin. Um, the instructor, who was a contract pilot for the Army, on the spur of the moment decided to do something that resulted in the aircraft spinning. Army student and a contract multi-engine instructor, they were doing a power on stall, and the instructor decides, I'll pull one power lever, lever to idle and, stall, and as he stalls. So we, those who fly uh, multi-engine airplanes know about velocity minimal controllable A, which is airborne. And so what happened? Well, the aircraft on, it went flat and it crashes. The instructor survived. Uh, so you have to ask yourself, is this a good idea? Obviously not, um, because that caused the yaw, the asymmetry of the operating engine against the non-operating engine. Um, we don't shut down engines and pull throttles unless we meet certain criteria according to the airman certification standards and good, uh, uh, the guidance in the airplane flying handbook and other books in common sense. So obviously he did not use, he used very poor judgment here. Um, you may see a smiley face in the cowl that has been cut into by the spinner. This is normally as a result of overstress and or weak, or weak engine mounts. Don't fly the airplane. Uh, smiley face on the bottom of the front of the cowl is because of positive Gs. On the top, it's negative Gs. We can see on the top there, that's where the spinner cuts into the very front of that cowling and makes a, uh, a frowny face on top and a smiley face on the bottom. So normally you'll see the uh, smiley face. Now this is not the, uh, the, the scratches that are a result of the spinner and the prop being taken off and replaced. Here's something that uh, would be behoove you to do Read the Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Now, this is not the uh, Airplane Flying Handbook. This is the uh, Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, page 7-9. It gives us several different methods of uh, demonstrating spatial disorientation. I did this to a young fellow the other day, teaching him basic attitude instrument flying. And, uh, and it works. 
uh, not well with everybody, but it does prove the point that you have to rely on the instruments. Uh, so those are the things that can be done. Climbing while accelerating, climbing while turning, diving while turning, reversal of motion, diving or rolling beyond the vertical plane. So seven, page 17.9 in, uh, in that book will give you some good guidance on how to induce vertigo so that your students will experience under controlled situation. Uh, you could look at that and make up your own little kneeboard uh, checklist on how to do it. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. I'll let you look at this one thing to say goodbye. And please don't uh, tell the FA that you saw that. And that's the end of my presentation, uh, Dominic. Thank you everybody for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. I uh, always love seeing the pits. It's fun to <laughs> see that in video. Um, it, if you're okay with it, Mark, I'd love to open up the floor now for questions. Sure. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself, or you could type it into the chat box, and we'll relay that question to Mark. I have a question. Okay, now here are the rules. Don't ask me something I don't know the answer to. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll have to find out. Um, when it comes to a flat spin, uh, I believe that's due to the placement of the CG being further aft or after the aft limit. So how does a pilot intentionally get into a flat spin and then recover from it? In uh, aircraft like the Pitts and the Exter, for example, uh, you simply add power. And there is a way of using the controls to help manage the uh, the bank as you go through it. I don't uh, I I don't teach flat spins, and I've only done a couple because there's no use for them in competition aerobatics. But basically, if you add power and as you said correctly, if you have an aft CG that could result in an, in a uh, flat spin as well. So the CG is very important when you're doing maneuvers. Okay. The other thing I wanted to, uh, whenever we get around to it, is back on slide 16, if we can get that link uh, posted into chat, it's a lot easier to copy it from there. Okay. Uh, Dominic, can you do that? Or? Yeah. Uh, would you mind just going back to slide 16, Mark? I'll just, I'll copy and paste it in the chat. Thank there you. you. Go. And if you can't find it, um, if it doesn't work, then just go to and Google um, Mooney aircraft crash on takeoff, and I think that's where you'll find it. Mooney crash three uh, three Mooney crashes in two weeks. You Google that, and it'll come up. I just published it there, Bob. Thanks, Dominic. Absolutely. What other questions does the group have for Mark? While we wait for people to either type in their, their questions um, or unmute themselves, I do have to say Mark is the spin doctor. So, you know, I, I, I don't even know if you have a number for how many spuns you've, you've done, Mark, but my guess is it has to be in the tens of thousands. Would that be incorrect to say? Uh, I, yeah, that's a good question. I've never counted them, to tell you the truth. Because usually my eyes are closed. <laughs> we, uh, I, I've spun like uh, Chris and uh, Rob, I believe it is, is uh, who the other person was who's, who flew the 37. We spun the 37. Uh, I got out of control a couple times in the F4, and that was uh, uh, interesting because it does a very nice tap roll which is simply a directed spin out of an accelerated stall. Don't do that in the airplane. You rip the tail off. Um, on the top six at SNJ, uh, it's extra um, Cubs, Jeep, some up <laughs> And we did have a, another question mark. Uh, Tom Huff asked, can you comment on spiral dive recovery procedures and the hazards involved? 
Well, the spiral dive uh, normally is a result of, dis of disorientation and uh, usually happens on a hazy day as per John F. Kennedy Jr., for example. So the, the, the question is, how do we avoid it? And this is one of the things that the FA uh, wants us to concentrate on teaching our students, how to avoid getting into spins, how to getting into, spir uh, getting into spirals. Uh, the attitude indicator, but also if you look at the wing, that helps you avoid that. But as far as the recovery goes, um, you simply have to roll wings level. How do you do that? Well, you can look outside or you can look at the attitude indicator and hopefully it's showing correctly. But here's the thing, because we have those heavy G's on our body and we roll out, we'll tend to keep those G's on our body as we pull the nose up and we pull the nose up too high. And it's an odd physiological fact that we put G on our body, we, we, we say to ourselves, okay, this is the way it should feel. Because if I re reduce the amount of G, I get light in the seat, and then I think I'm going down. Again, it's all inner ear uh, driven, and we've got to rely on the instruments. It's really, that's the bottom line. So basically, you can pull some power off to full power reduction, all the way to idle, roll, nice coordinated roll, and then bring the nose up and let it sit in the horizon. Let your body acclimate to that. Uh, as far as vertigo goes, I've had my share. Um, uh, the worst was on the wing at night coming back from the tanker that slightly happened to break the boom so that we were all low on gas getting back to our base. And uh, we're in heavy weather and all, all I could see was the, uh, the navigation light on the right wing. And I swore that I was in a 90 degree bank. And so uh, oddly enough, when the, uh, when the flight lead cleared me off, I looked at the attitude indicator because you can't see it because all you're looking at is the light and try not to hit the other aircraft. And all of a sudden my inner ear erected itself and I it was straight and level and I was fine. It was very, very odd. Uh, but I found the next morning I woke up, my left arm was uh, bruised because I was being so hard against the canopy rail. I hope that answers the question. And we have another one from uh, Joshua Wright. Uh, Joshua asks, for a spin, what would be a use case for turning into the spin? Um, or would you recommend always using neutral air lines? Okay, you're a little broken. I think that question was concerning um, whether or not you should use ailerons into the spin. I would suggest, be, unless you do one heck of a lot of spins and maybe even fly competition in an aerobatic airplane, keep the ailerons neutral, concentrate on that. That will take some use, getting used to because our, our just like in a skidding car, our natural tendency is to go the other way. Uh, could you let go of the ailerons? Sure, you could with the hope that they would remain neutral but that may not always be the case because I've seen the ailerons and the, uh, the stick go in all different directions, mostly back or forward, depending on if it's an upright or inverted spin. Okay. Does that answer your question, Joshua? Not hearing Joshua, but I got one more if I could. Oh, absolutely. By the way, thank you for putting the link in the uh, chat. Sure. Uh, that was very makes, makes it very convenient. Um, number number of years ago, there was a uh, incident. Um, about, I'm sorry. Can I speak? Okay. Yep, I, I have you clear, Bar. Uh, can you hear him, Mark? Yeah, I can. This is Tom again. This is Bob. Oh, Bob. Okay. Um, number of years ago, there was a uh, Beach 1900 in Charlotte. I uh, had three strikes against it before it left the ground. It was over gross. CG was determined to be outside the envelope on the aft side. And also the uh, elevator rigging was misrigged. So uh, it, it took off. It like pitched up 30 degrees nose up and never departed from that attitude until stalled and crashed. Okay. Um, if a pilot finds himself in an airplane uh, that happens to be configured that way, unfortunately, hopefully not. But if it does, is there any way to recover from that type of uh, situation? Well, I don't know if you remember the, uh, you remember seeing the right stuff and they talk about uh, 
they're they're uh, talking about the crashes out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and they're all cooking uh, hot dogs out there, and they're and they're talking about well, he was dead before he ever took off. So there's certain situations that are just unre unrecoverable. It's really that simple. So it sounds like this is the case. Uh, somebody made a mistake. Somebody made an error. And as we know, when there's an accident, there's, there's a chain of events that as pilots, we have to find the link that we can cut so that the, the, um, the chain is stopped and we don't have the accident. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have to do a good pre-flight. You have to understand the airplane, do a weight and balance. Um, and do all those other things to make sure the airplane's ready. On check rides, the one thing that um, is disturbing to me is how fast some people will go through things um, and not really prepare themselves for flight. Uh, it's a mental state. And we talk about the I'm safe checklist. And uh, we've got to make sure that our mental, that our, our, our heart is in it and our brain is in it. And we're thinking just about flying the airplane and nothing else. Okay. The, the only way to break a stall uh, is to push the elevator forward? Unless you're stalled inverted. You've got to do something to reduce the angle of attack. Uh, um, I have a, a fraternity brother who was telling me about some old, old, old pilot that he knew where they used to have a guy running up and down the fuselage, this is long ago, and he would actually change the center of gravity to make the airplane go up and down. I'm not sure how effective that was, but that's the way they used to do it. But yeah, you need to get the nose down. Uh, I'm sorry, you need to reduce the angle of attack. I say nose down because that's the way it's normally presented, uh, teaching in light aircraft. But you've got to reduce the angle of attack. Um, uh, think about this, you shoot an arrow into the air and if you shoot it straight, it eventually starts to sag and goes down and hits the ground. They, those little feathers are always trying to seek zero angle of attack, and that's what you're looking to do, is to minimize the angle of attack by releasing the back pressure. And in the case of the T-37, T-6 S and J, shoveling that stick hard forward and really smashing it against the uh, instrument panel, full forward and holding it there until uh, the, re the aircraft goes into the recovery mode. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you for the question. And uh, Finn asked a question in the comment section. He said, uh, hi Mark, when CFI applicants come to you for their practical test, what common errors do you see in their spin instruction? Uh, I did cover, that's a good question. Uh, I did cover a couple. One is, uh, what is your, your airspeed? And the answer is stall, that's all you have to say. Uh, and the other one is neutralize the rudder. Um, and most everybody comes with the knowledge of the different phases of the, of the uh, spin, the incipient and developed or recovery, so on and so forth. Um, most people know that and you have to be able to explain that to, uh, to, to the examiner and to your students. Thanks, Mark. And um, does anyone else have questions for Mark? This has been great. Yeah, this is Greg. Uh, one more question. Uh, Mark, um, so my uh, previous experience was in the 37 spins, as you well know. And okay. so I, I at uh, this point in my life, uh, took taken up a super decathlon and spun that. And I found that the nose was far below the horizon more than the 37 was. And if I looked at the airspeed, it was probably about maybe one half, probably twice what it was. So I felt that the decathlon was closer to the relative wind at that point um, and not having spun a recips at that before this point I don't know if you have anything any comments on that but I, I'd be very interested because that was my most ex mo most recent experience well that's a that's a very interesting question Greg um, and I'm glad you asked that because um, in the airplanes that I that I've taught in there's all kinds of different ways to spin believe it or not we always think about the 1g spin straight level are off stall, stall warning uh, and buff it, and then we yank the stick back and kick the rudder. But in competition aerobatic, uh, we don't consider the spin an un un 
um, an out of control uh, uh, maneuver at all, because we can manipulate the controls so that when we stop the aircraft spinning, we can um, have it stop with the wings level. If you do a one and a half turn spin, for example, what you'll find is when you stop it, if you hold the stick all the way back and hold the rudder all the way in and, and the power is off, <laughs> excuse me, the aircraft when it stops actually has, if you consider an airplane vertical, <coughs> excuse me, not COVID, um, but if the airplane won't be vertical, it'll be angled, it'll be slightly one wing into the ground, um, but if you when you spin it, if you take out some of the uh, take out some of the elevator and take out just a little bit of rudder when it stops, you can you can end up uh, vertical. Also, some airplanes like the uh, the extra, when you slow it down, you add just a little bit of power to help the rotation, and it's better to spin one way as opposed to the other way because of the rotation of the propeller and the torque. So um, those all are factors that we use in competition uh, spins that will manipulate the aircraft and make it spin the way we want it to. And the difference on the recovery is in when we recover in our spin training for our spin certification for the CFIs is that we just stop the spin and pull right out. In competition, you have to set a vertical line. There's no set amount of vertical that you must uh, subtend, but, and then you pull out. And that's the difference between uh, a, a regular spin and a competition spin. Yeah, thanks. My uh, my objective at this point in my life is to get a ride in extra, and uh, I, I might be able to do that. So thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. This is like a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. You buy me enough Guinness, you may uh, get a ride in an extra. You never know. <laughs> you're you're, on. Got a you're lot of, on on that one. <laughs> you got a lot of people who want to fly the airplane. I, I actually, I, have no, I don't have time to fly myself, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, well, I spoke with uh, with Brian, who was a Thunderbird lead, uh, and he's out at, at uh, Hanscom now. And uh, so we talked about that. So when those guys get an extra, I, I I begged to ride in one of those things. Oh, okay, cool, cool. It's a uh, it's a good airplane. It's a lot of fun. And uh, the interesting thing about the extra is that it's a 10G airplane when it's at a certain weight, but the main spar is, is capable of a 20G. So they put two 10G. Uh, spars together, so it's really hard to break the airplane. Bumping for a ride as well. Uh, <laughs> what other questions do we have for Mark? This has been a great conversation. Okay. Any anything else? Don't see anything else in the comments section. So unless someone chimes in, Mark, thank you so much again for doing this uh, as always. Uh, it's just such a phenomenal experience learning from you and your wealth of knowledge and experience throughout your entire career. Um, we will be posting this presentation for those of you who asked uh, onto YouTube at a later date. And if you are looking for FA Wings credit, or NBAA CAM credit, again, please email us at uh, snoosafety at snoo.edu. And Mark, thanks again. I uh, hope to see some of you at our 6.30 presentation with Dr. Dan Bauer from the NTSB. Okay, I'm uh, actually going to go home and uh, eat dinner because I've been here all day, pretty much. <laughs> but I, I would, I, I, if I get home in time, I will, uh, I will get on and take a look at that because uh, NTSB uh, actually did uh, not really work with them, but I investigated accidents, um, a couple of accidents uh, with their permission, and they were just great. They, they do a, a great service for, uh, for the aviation community. And, and uh, Dom, I thank you and, uh, for setting all this up. You're great, as always, and I um, uh, hope to see you soon. Good luck with uh, you know, all the best to you and your family and Amelia and to everybody there. And thank you again for uh, letting me uh, make this presentation. Fly safe. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. <laughs> you too. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you hopefully at 6.30.